Hi all, and welcome to the first episode of the Healthcare and Healing Podcast. My name is Kira. And I'm Dave. I'm Crystal. I'm Isabel. I'm Rose. And I'm Molly. And we are so excited to have you here with us today. To kick off our first episode, we are going to get an in-depth understanding of the healthcare landscape within Europe, paying specific attention to the countries we researched. Germany, Italy, France, Spain, Lithuania, and the UK. Let's jump right in. So to start things off, I have a question for the team. I'd like everyone to talk about what are the three most important things to know about your country's healthcare system? Um, I can kick us off for this question. Um, so this is Crystal and I'm talking about France. Um, and the three most important things that I would want um, someone to know about France's healthcare system is that France has a universal healthcare system. It's called SHI, um, and it's universally granted to all citizens, as well as financed through national income tax, payroll taxes, as well as product taxes. Um, France is not broken up into districts, but instead the government regulates healthcare costs, sets new guidelines for budgets, and sets the national strategy for all of France. And then lastly, the Ministry of Solidarity and Health is responsible for planning and the regulation of nationwide laws and regulations. I can jump in next. Um, this is Isabel with Spain. And the majority of Spaniards rely on Spain's Sistema Nacional de Salud, which um, is, goes as SNS. And that's what they go for, for their healthcare needs. And through the SNS, Spaniards have access to free and high quality healthcare. Um, some individuals do supplement their national health care coverage with um, private health care coverage, and that's about 13.5% of Spaniards currently. In Madrid, that can be up to 27.9% of the population, um, and those enrolled in private insurance are allowed to access private hospitals and health care providers. And then the SNS does function on both national and regional le level. Um, the Spanish healthcare system is pretty decentralized, meaning that each of the 17 regions of, or autonomous communities in Spain are responsible for local management of the healthcare system. Yeah. Similar to Spain, Italy also has um, a decentralized healthcare system. And that, this is Dana, and I'm going to be talking about that today. Um, they have a national healthcare system that provides coverage for all citizens and residents. Um, in Italy's case, the decentralization of the system means that the government sets the standards of care and the different regions throughout Italy are in charge of providing that care and making decisions to fit each individual region's needs. Um, it's also important to know for this podcast that recently there, have been, uh, there has been a large austerity bill enacted in Italy that has cut the funding and resources for this national healthcare system. Thanks, Dana. So moving on to Germany, this is Kira here. There are three pretty unique things about the system. The most unique thing about Germany's system is that the healthcare is absolutely mandatory in Germany. So it ends up parsing out that 86% of the population is enrolled in statutory healthcare, um, which some other folks talked about as SHI, while the rest opt for private insurance plans. The second most important thing to know is that the decision-making authority within Germany's healthcare system is pretty difficult to discern. Um, the federal government actually isn't involved in the direct delivery of healthcare. So you rely on entities called sickness funds. So the way the sickness fund works is that the German citizens pay a certain amount of their wage um, every month, about 14.6% of gross wages, and that files into the sickness fund, and then those disseminate out to cover most procedures and medications for German citizens which makes it a pretty unique system for Germany. Um, and finally, the Robert Koch Institute is a name you should definitely know in relation to the pandemic in Germany. The Institute tracks infectious diseases from influenza um, to Ebola and was essential in Germany's response to the pandemic. And I'm here to talk, to talk about the UK. Um, I would say the three most important things to note with the United Kingdom's healthcare system are the cost, efficiency, and long-term sustainability issues. It is one of the highest, higher cost healthcare systems compared with the European Union average. But despite this, it is surprisingly lower cost per person than countries with similarly ranked GDPs. This has been a recent development as healthcare funding through the NHS has failed to keep pace with inflation. 
The second element is efficiency. The United Kingdom prior to 2020 was touted for its high efficiency system with positive health outcomes coming from shorter hospital stays and fewer hospital beds per person than average keeping costs relatively down. The third element is more of an issue in terms of long-term sustainability in, of the current system. The United Kingdom is facing a significant shortage of medical workers and has been working to address this problem since the early 2000s, but is facing little success regarding this issue. I'm going to finish it off by talking about Lithuania. Uh, Lithuania has a statutory health insurance scheme that covers primary, emergency, uh, and most specialist care and is compulsory for all citizens. Um, the Minister of Health makes the policy decisions in Lithuania, but the 10 regions are in charge of administering health care. Lithuania, uh, and finally, Lithuania spends uh, significantly less of their GDP on health care than other EU countries. Uh, in 2017, the EU GDP average was 9.8%, while Lithuania's uh, expenditure was significantly less at 6.5%. Uh, those are the three most important things. And can move on to the next question. Wonderful. Thanks, guys. So I think at this point, we've got a pretty deep understanding of what the most important things about every country is. So now we'd like to move on and talk about, in particular, how strong the hospital systems are in our country. As we're going to see in our later episodes, this is going to be a pretty significant factor in how well each country handled the pandemic. So I can kick things off speaking to Germany. So within the EU, Germany is a pretty strong leader in terms of healthcare capacity, has about 8.3 hospital beds per 1,000 people, um, which is pretty high for EU standards. They have about 2,000 hospitals, half are private, half are public. Um, but what makes Germany so prepared for the pandemic and what made them so prepared for the pandemic um, was that the sickness funds and the private insurers within Germany actually use the same providers for healthcare. So this means that a hospital or physician can treat any patient, no matter which type of health insurance they have. So this aspect of the system actually allowed German citizens to be treated at any center during the COVID-19 um, pandemic, which was a fact that was pretty integral to Germany's success. So overall, because of this high um, hospital capacity, Germany was able to pull initial waves pretty, pretty well. To speak to the opposite about, of that a little bit, um, the United Kingdom only had about 2.5 beds per 1,000 people, which is just about half of the UK average of 4.59 hospital beds per 1,000 people, putting it at the second lowest in the U European Un Union prior to Brexit. Um, this shows a remarkable lack of hospital um, capacity. And prior to the pandemic, this was a very positive thing pointing to the healthcare system's efficiency. But as we can see in later podcasts, this did turn out to be a problem with overload in the healthcare system. Great. So pretty interesting to see then the two sides of the coin, Germany kind of versus the UK, how that hospital capacity is going to play into later episodes. Now we'd like to explore a little bit more um, about the quality of care within these EU countries. So I'd like to toss it over to France and Italy to speak about their different experiences with quality of care. Yeah, so for France, um, France's healthcare system um, was rated number one in the world by the WHO in 2001, which um, made it into like a very strong um, seemingly strong quality of healthcare system. And then a more recent statistic would be, um, it was um, ranked as number 15 out of 193 countries by the Lancet. And this was in 2015. Um, and then to kind of talk about the doctor patient ratio, um, there's a ratio of 3.4 primary care doctors um, per 100,000 population. Um, so that put France at a seemingly advantage for the pandemic as well. Yeah, similar to France, Italy actually ranked right after them, uh, second in the world in 2001. Um, and they also reported a ratio of 5.74 nurses per 1,000 patients in 2018. Overall, Italy has reported one of the oldest life expectancies at 84 years and has a healthcare system to support this. Um, but because of the decentralization of the system, some areas of Italy, such as the richer northern regions, uh, provide better and even specialized care compared to the southern regions. Great. Thanks so much, guys. And we've talked a lot of facts and talked a lot of data at this point. So I'd like to know on a more qualitative level, 
are the citizens of each of your countries happy with the state of healthcare in your country at this point? I can start us off in this conversation. So Spanish citizens have become increasingly frustrated with the state of healthcare in their country. Um, the enactment of austerity policies in 2010 have led to a complicated relationship between the Spanish people and their healthcare systems. As a result of these austerity policies, wait lists have filled up, resources have dwindled, and doctors and nurses have fled the country for higher pay um, wages in other countries in the EU. So the Spanish people have called for increased input on healthcare decisions um, through their autonomous communities, which has led to further decentralization. Yeah, similar to what Isabel said, um, the austerity measures in Italy uh, have actually caused co-payments for citizens to rise to an all-time high, which is a factor that has led Italians to be less and less satisfied with their healthcare system. Um, something else to go along with that is the north-south regional divide that I had mentioned earlier. Northern regions have a significantly higher GDP than the national average, um, while some southern regions can't even provide the standards of care that they are supposed to according to the national health care system. Um, combining these two factors together makes Italians pretty unsatisfied with their health care system leading up to the pandemic. Yeah, so unlike Italy, Germany unfortunately doesn't have that north-south divide, but their healthcare system has been kind of long hailed as a model for other countries to follow. So there's an ongoing debate in the US, um, at least prior to the pandemic about should the US adopt a kind of a German system of healthcare, but this model isn't really without their own problems. So similar to what other people were speaking about, the largest challenge for Germany's healthcare system has actually been faced with the rising costs of healthcare. So they have a pretty rapidly aging population um, and a lot of stagnant overall growth. So cost pressures began to mount around 2010. Um, so they've been inst instituting a few different policies to try to avoid unnecessary expenditures from their patients. However, they're still kind of in the cost um, quelling phase at this point, trying to keep those costs under control. Yeah, speaking of very high costs, um, while there's a lot of like general approval of the healthcare system of, by the citizens in Lithuania, there's a lot of unhappiness surrounding the high cost of pharmaceuticals. Uh, medication is not well covered by the national health insurance, resulting in just astronomical pharmaceutical costs. Uh, even before the before the COVID-19 pandemic, the issue with pharmaceuticals was considered the greatest crisis facing the Lithuanian healthcare system. And there's been a lot of pushback by the citizens to address this issue and hopefully lower some of the payments result, result around pharmaceuticals. Great, so at this point we've talked hospitals, we've talked most important facts and we've understood maybe the problems of some of our healthcare systems. Taking all of that into account, how prepared would you say your country was for the pandemic? Understanding no country truly could anticipate what was gonna happen, but how did the healthcare infrastructure make your country prepared for the pandemic? Um, I can speak to that for France. Um, so kind of how I talked about um, earlier in this episode, um, France has had a top ranking healthcare system. So it was at a seemingly adv advantageous position to stop the spread of COVID-19 um, when it started to emerge as a global um, public health emergency in 2020. Uh, but yet the, the pandemic brought to light many of the structural weaknesses of the French healthcare system um, in relation to their governance, as well as their decision-making processes. Um, so the French healthcare system used a top-down centralized um, control measures um, to COVID-19, which slowed its response to the rapidly surging pandemic and contributed to the high death toll as well. Uh, but more in terms of preparedness um, in the past, the government um, originally had a robust prevention policy in place to protect against um, infectious diseases um, in the nation, such as COVID, until the H1N1 pandemic, which occurred in 2009. Um, so the government's response to this pandemic was deemed by taxpayers as an overreaction, uh, which led to cuts in the prevention policy and put in place um, um, instead more pressing needs, leaving France exposed to future pandemics. Um, and France was also unable to stop the virus because they had a lack of PPE that left um, 
French medical professionals, as well as essential workers, essentially defenseless. Um, and this was in large part due to the destruction of masks in 2018 that were deemed by the French Public Health Agency as expired and therefore ineffective, which is very interesting, um, but something that definitely contributed to the high death toll as well. Um, and around um, 250 million surgical masks were destroyed in this in 2019, and another um, 350 million masks were going to be destroyed in 2020. Um, France did not have enough masks to supply the healthcare workers to protect them against the virus, which led to inability to stop the spread of the virus. And also in terms of um, preparedness, a lot of the public health um, hospital workers were on strike before this, before the pandemic, for 10 months before the pandemic. Um, due to insufficient healthcare workers to meet patient demands, equipment decreases, as well as horrible salaries. So in terms of healthcare workers, uh, France was not as prepared as um, a lot of the other countries that people will discuss as well in the EU. Yeah, Spain had some similar issues to um, France, especially in terms of healthcare workers. However, Spain's Global Health Security Index of 65.9 out of 100 suggests that it's decently well prepared for a global health threat. So this index takes into account each country's performance in six categories, which include prevention, detection and reporting, rapid response, health system, compliance with international norms, and risk environment. And then based on the GHS index, Spain's strengths included real-time surveillance and reporting, data integration among health uh, sectors, risk communication, trade and travel restrictions, and cross-border agreements. The country's weaknesses, according to this index, included prevention of zoonic diseases, exercising response plans, and financing. And financing largely impacted Spain's preparedness for the COVID-19 pandemic. So following the economic crisis in 2008, Spain introduced austerity measures to reduce spending on healthcare, among other sectors of the economy. Um, a lower healthcare budget drove up patients' out-of-pocket expenditures on healthcare and drove up, uh, drove down healthcare professionals' salaries. So, as a result, patients um, are increasingly leaning on private insurance, and healthcare professional professionals are um, seeking work abroad. So this has led to a reduced medical staff in many hospitals and an increased workload for that existing medical staff. And um, that has also led to uh, further physician and nurse burnout. So hopefully this paints a little bit more of a realistic image of the state of Spain's healthcare system in the months leading up to the COVID-19 pandemic. I wish I could bring some uh, positivity into this story with Italy, but unfortunately, um, Italy, France, and Spain all have similar stories. Um, just like France, when the H1N1 pandemic spread to Italy in 2009, health officials cracked down on it immediately, preventing huge surges in cases, but also leading people to believe infectious diseases were not a serious threat. Um, there was even a significant 9% drop in vaccination rates in Italy after the um, H1N1 pandemic. Uh, the public opinion combined with the austerity me measures that I had previously mentioned um, left Italy in a vulnerable position, similar, like I said, to what France and Spain have talked about. Yeah, so similar to Italy, I think we're going to see with Germany in later episodes, um, that similar idea of the belief that infectious diseases weren't actually a serious threat. But kind of getting back to the topic, Germany seemed pretty prepared actually to handle the oncoming pandemic, at least from a healthcare standpoint. So we talked a little bit about their ample hospital capacity. They have a pretty high doctor to patient ratio, um, about 8.3 and universal coverage for citizens. Um, so they seemed pretty, pretty able to handle the oncoming waves. They're also home to the Robert Koch Institute, which is a federal agency located in Berlin, dedicated to infectious disease control and prevention. So the Institute has been integral in preventing previous pandemics, um, previous outbreaks of influenza and Ebola, as I had mentioned earlier, and they were pretty essential within the COVID-19 response as well. So they were had a history of knowing how to track diseases, how to prepare for diseases. So heading into this pandemic, they were pretty comfortable with what to do and what protocol to follow. And they 
ended up relying on the global pandemic preparedness guidelines prepared by the WHO as well. So ultimately um, felt pretty confident heading into the pandemic that they were able to at least handle the first um, the first waves. Similarly to Germany with a high confidence heading in, the UK seemed perfectly poised to handle a pandemic. With years of global health security indexes claiming they were well prepared beyond most nations to handle pandemic, many leaders did not worry themselves in the beginning of the pandemic, even Boris Johnson missing the first five healthcare system meetings in the early months of January and February 2020. This itself became a big part of the problem of early 2020. Like many other wealthy nations, the UK had cut funding toward pandemic defense after the H1N1 scare and further in the following years as political money saving moves. While preventive health care such as vaccinations were overall relatively high in the UK, without public funding, the pandemic response team was unable to adequately prepare. Of course, no nations were truly prepared for the pandemic, but I think the UK provides an interesting focal point for nations that were unprepared due in part to their perception of being prepared. Thank you so much, guys. And with that, I think we are ready to wrap up our first episode of Healthcare and Healing. So we hope you've enjoyed as much as we have. Um, tune up to the next episode to get a better look at the intersection between healthcare and politics. Thanks so much for listening.